All right. Hi, Girl Scouts and Eco Advocates. We're going to give it a minute. I know everyone's time is valuable, but we're going to give it a minute as everyone logs on. So please be patient. All right. Welcome, Eco Advocates, and hello, Girl Scouts. Let's celebrate the Marine Mammal Protection Act by protecting and learning about it like a Girl Scout. The Marine Mammal Protection Act was enacted on October 19th of 1972. It is 49 years of protecting marine mammals. We'll take this opportunity to celebrate and learn about the act and how it protects marine mammals. Thank you for joining us virtually for our six endangered species webinar. Each webinar highlights different guest speakers and spotlights different species. These webinars are uniquely their own. If you've joined us before, we know that you will learn something new. We are highlighting NOAA guest speakers and the species they protect. These are women the world needs. Today is a great day to learn about these protected species as they are at risk and to participate and will participate in local conservation efforts. We'll learn what we can do to make a difference in our own backyard. And it's a day to recognize and support the national effort to protect these marine mammals and their habitats. Hello everyone, my name is Carrie Horton and I work for Girl Scouts Nation's Capital. With me on this webinar is our guest speakers from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. They are Jill Seymour and Jenna Malik. Helping with all the tech is Rachel Haggard and NOAA from NOAA and Nicole Lemer from GSCNC. Let's get started. Okay. Okay. Um, girl, whoops. Oh. Girls, we're going to take an opportunity to just look over our promise and our law, as the idea is that we use resources wisely and make the world a better place. So, this is what we're looking at today um, Girl Scout Law and making the, play, making the world a better place. Okay. The National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, works to protect and conserve all marine mammals found in U.S. waters. Marine mammals are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and depending on their status can also be protected by the Endangered Species Act. These species face many threats in our ocean today and are a key part of the ecosystem. We're gonna learn about the Cook Inlet beluga whales and the North Pacific right whales. So NOAA's mission statement is to understand and predict changes in climate, weather, oceans, and, co and the coast to share that knowledge and information with others and to conserve and manage coastal and marine ecosystem and their resources. So let's bring out the GIRL in Girl Scouts and look at getting started on this patch virtually today. We will be completing most of step two and four of the Endangered Species Protection, Endangered Species Patch Program and Cadets Step Three in the Cadets STEM Career Badge. I hope you have all already downloaded the Endangered Species um, booklet. If not, we will add it to the chat and it is on our Girl Scout website. It's under Kids and Patches. It'll be on our final slide. And I also send out a thank you email. So it'll be on that. So when you've earned this patch, you'll dive deep into learning about the Cook Inlet Beluga Whales and the North Pacific right whales and how the Marine Mammal Protection Act and Endangered Species protects them. 
With this webinar today, we are inspiring you to complete this patch. This patch program cannot be completed in an hour on a webinar, but we hope to get you started on your passion for protecting the environment. Um, I just have a few um, housekeeping rules um, we would like to cover before we get started first. Our NOAA guest speakers and I will be the only ones using our microphones and cameras today as we are on a webinar. If you have any questions, please just type them in the question box at the right of your window or in the chat. Please use the question box for on top of questions during the webinar as we want to answer your questions. And there'll also be time at the end of the webinar to ask additional questions as we're gonna stay on until 8.15 for questions and answers. So I would like to take a moment to introduce myself. Hi everyone, I am Carrie from part of the um, council program department as a lifetime member of Girl Scouts and part of our council staff. I want to expose you to our environment and be a sister to every Girl Scouts. I am excited to share my knowledge and passion with you today. I want to introduce you to our leaders. So just quickly, today is our sixth webinar partnering with NOAA over the past year. I know from their mission statement, and, enjoy, and they enjoy sharing their knowledge and information with everyone from protecting the oceans to the species that inhabits it. I wanna take a moment to thank everyone from NOAA who has shared their knowledge with Girl Scouts and participated in these awesome webinars. These have been amazing webinars and extraordinary researchers. And let me start by introducing our two leaders. Welcome Jill and Jenna from the great state of Alaska. Welcome, Jill. We are so excited to have you here and talk about how you protect these species. And welcome, Jenna. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Jill Seymour. And um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon or evening to learn about some of our charismatic Alaska marine mammals. Um, I am a marine mammal specialist for NOAA fisheries in the Alaska region. And my primary responsibility in that position is to be the recovery coordinator for the Cook Inlet Beluga Whale, which I'll be talking to you about this evening or this afternoon. Um, basically, what that means is that I oversee um, Cook Inlet Beluga research, management, public education, and outreach. I am a former Brownie and Girl Scout, uh, despite the fact that I couldn't find a photo of myself in uniform. And when I'm not working, I love to travel, um, engage in long distance backpacking. I also build musical instruments. And lately I've been spending a lot of time hanging out at home with my two cats and my dog. So I'm looking forward to talking to you this evening. Welcome, Jenna. Great, we thank go. you, Carrie. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jenna Malik. I am also a marine mammal specialist with NOAA Fisheries in the Alaska region. Jill and I work in the same office. Um, my background is actually in marine science and ecology. And in my current position, I'm the recovery coordinator for North Pacific right whales. And I also work on harbor seal issues in Alaska. I conduct consultations that are under the Endangered Species Act, which we'll be telling you more about in just a bit. And I work really closely with our Alaska Native partners here because it's a very unique culture and a really fun place to work. Similar to Jill, I am a former Brownie and a Girl Scout. I was only able to find some of my Brownie photos, um, not too many from Girl Scouts, unfortunately, but um, so I've been through a lot of what you guys are doing and I'm very excited that you have an endangered species patch now. And when I'm not saving the whales, I enjoy running, going on adventures with my dog and generally relaxing by the ocean. And back over to you, Carrie. Thank you. Cadets, seniors, and ambassadors, do you want to protect wildlife, our environment, and make the world a better place? I just launched a poll so I could see what you guys think, because um, as a Girl Scout, I know the three of us on screen are, of course, we're all Girl Scouts. But sometimes I think um, everyone's excited, but they need more direction. So we are here to give you guys direction. All right. All right, so eco-advocates. As Girl Scouts, environmental stewardship has been a key part of the Girl Scout experience for over a century. 
Um, what did we say or look at at the beginning of our meeting? The Girl Scout promise and the law. So we want to use resources wisely and to make the world a better place. So our agenda today is when you earn this patch, you'll dive deep into the ESA from the history of the ESA to taking action and including the Marine Mammal Protection Act. With this webinar today, we are giving you the tools to complete this patch. The patch program, again, can't be completed in an hour, but we hope to start your passion for protecting the endangered species. Um, there are five steps to complete. We are going to complete some activities today. There's more detail than a handout I'll provide later. And today we will be completing most of step two and step four of the patch program. So we need you to complete step one, which is explore, step three, which is create, and of course, step five, which is present. So we are gonna investigate two endangered species and we're also gonna experience NOAA scientists, their careers and how they are protecting endangered species. And again, check out the booklet when you get a chance. So let's learn about endangered and threatened species, the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And I'm gonna hand this webinar over to our guest speakers to get us started. Hi everyone. So um, we're in a unique position today to talk about endangered species that also happen to be marine mammals. And so there are actually two different laws um, that help protect marine mammals that are endangered. And the first one which I'm going to introduce is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And then uh, Jenna is going to talk to you a bit about the Endangered Species Act. And we're talking about the Marine Mammal Protection Act first because it actually predates the Endangered Species Act. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act was enacted by Congress on October 21st, 1972. So that means it just celebrated its 49th birthday a week ago today. And one of the things that made this act very unique was the fact that it was the first act of Congress to call specifically for an ecosystem approach to wildlife management. So not focusing on, say, a single species, but the ecosystem that that species lived in as a whole. So the two primary goals of the Marine Mammal Protection Act are to prevent marine mammal species and stocks or populations from decreasing or diminishing in number to the point where they're no longer a significant functioning part of their ecosystems. So right there, you can see that, that that's where that ecosystem approach to management occurs. And the other objective of the act was and is to restore diminished species and stocks to their optimum sustainable populations. So that means the a uh, number of animals that the habitat can support with food, et cetera. So um, moving on to the next slide. So how does NOAA Fisheries implement the Marine Mammal Protection Act or the MMPA? So we work jointly with our partner agency, the US Fish and Wildlife Service to manage and conserve marine mammals. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife is responsible for managing and protecting polar bears, walruses, sea otters, and manatees. And NOAA Fisheries is responsible for all of our other marine mammal species. So whales, porpoises, dolphins, sea otters, and sea, or pardon me, not sea otters, that's fish and wildlife, but seals and sea lions. And we do that in part by managing authorizations and scientific permits so that um, activities that occur around and with marine mammals are conducted in a way that minimizes or avoids adverse impacts to individual marine mammals as well as the population. We also, of course, evaluate the status of marine mammal populations. That's a necessary step in order to determine whether um, those marine mammal populations are depleted or um, in or if they're at op those optimal sustainable population levels. We also respond to marine mammal entanglements and strandings, and we have nationwide networks for each of these incidences. And we also investigate unusual mortality events. So that's a term that NOAA Fisheries uses, and what it basically describes is situations like when you have a, a, a stranding of a large number of animals all at once, um, and we don't know why, um, 
our agency goes out and tries to determine why that stranding occurred or that un, what we call unusual mortality event occurred. And now I'm gonna pass it to Jenna and she's gonna talk a bit about the Endangered Species Act, which pertains to those, endanger, those marine mammals as well as non-marine mammals that are covered by this act. Great, thank you, Jill. So as Jill mentioned, the Endangered Species Act was passed a year after the Marine Mammal Protection Act, so in December of 1973. However, this was not the first act that, it, that tried to protect species that were not doing very well. But the Endangered Species Act really kind of hit a home run and was able to do a lot of things that the previous acts were unable to do. And some of these things include listing species, um, preventing listed species from being killed or harmed. And this extended not just to vertebrates, so animals with backbones, but also to plants and invertebrates as well. So this was the first time those species had such protections. The Endangered Species Act also protects the habitat that is essential to the species. And you might hear this referred to as critical habitat. And we are also required to create recovery plans to help with all of these species um, to come back from, from the conditions that they're in. So you can see here the North Pacific Right Whale Recovery Plan, and then there's also a recovery plan and a conservation plan for Cook Inlet Belugas. So the really cool thing about the Endangered Species Act though, is that it addressed both domestic, so at home in the US and international worldwide, the conservation um, of species. And it's the strongest act that's ever been passed by any nation for protecting the variety of species that we find here on earth or the biodiversity on earth. Next slide, please. So the Endangered Species Act also defined a few important things for us. And before we jump into the first two terms, I wanna talk about extinction. And so when in the context of the Endangered Species Act, when we say extinct, this means that there are no known living individuals of a species. So with that in mind, the Endangered Species Act can list a species as endangered, which means that a species is in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. A species can also be listed as threatened, which means it's likely to become endangered within the foreseeable future. So on a scale from bad to worse, threatened is bad and endangered is worse. But there's a little bit more to the ex extinction story that we can share with you. Next slide, please. So there are different levels of extinction. The first is locally extinct. And this occurs when a species ceases to exist in a certain geographic area. So let's say we have uh, a species of whale that lives in the Pacific Ocean. And all of a sudden, we're not seeing any more of the individuals of the species on the Eastern Pacific Ocean and they're only in the Western Pacific, then we could say that that species is locally extinct in, in the Eastern Pacific. Functionally extinct has to do with when you have so few individuals of a species left that they can't carry out the role that they used to serve in their ecosystem. So if you think about beavers, for example, these guys engineer their entire habitat, right? They build dams and they create habitat for other species. And so if all of a sudden there are only a couple of beavers, they wouldn't be able to maintain those dams or build new ones and their entire function within their ecosystem would cease. So this is what we would consider to be functionally extinct. And then extinct in the wild is kind of a fancy political term that's got a lot of um, jargon behind it, but the, the crux of it is that um, it, an animal or a species is extinct in the wild when the only living individuals are found in captivity. But just because you're found only in captivity doesn't mean that that's the end. So there are institutions like the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute in Front Royal, Virginia, that actually specialize in studying captive animals in the hopes of being able to reintroduce them back into the wild once they become extinct in the wild. And a great example of this would be the black-footed ferret, which was extinct in the wild. They were able to study it and breed it in captivity, and it is now back at being a functional part of its ecosystem. So now that you know a little bit more background about the Endangered Species Act, we're gonna turn it back over to Carrie to continue walking you through the steps for getting your endangered species patch. Thank you, Jill and Jenna, for such an insightful talk about the importance of both the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. 
Now let's take a deeper dive and learn more about the two marine mammal species and how our NOAA researchers and how they are protecting them. Um, Jill, we are waiting to hear more about the species in the spotlight. Thanks, Carrie. So um, as Carrie mentioned, um, I wanted to give a shout out to a NOAA program that's been in place now for a couple of years called the Species in the Spotlight before we dive into learning more about the two species that we'll be hearing about this evening. So the Species in the Spotlight program is a newer effort by NOAA that's been around for just a couple of years now. Um, and the purpose of this program is to highlight those species that NOAA Fisheries manages that are in, endangered, that are most at risk, in our opinion, of extinction. And part of this program um, is to help this, these species um, by prioritizing them and prioritizing efforts for research and funding and resources so that we can ensure that they don't go extinct. Um, the Cook Inlet Beluga is one of nine current species in the spotlight and I'll be talking about that species shortly. The North Pacific right whale is not currently a species in the spotlight. However, if this list is expanded in the future, there is the opportunity for that species to join these ones that you see here on this screen. So let's go ahead and learn some about Cook Inlet Belugas to start us off. Um, we're gonna go through some taxonomy but um, first off, I wanna say for those who might not be that familiar with beluga whales, beluga whales are a small white whale um, that lives in the Arctic. They are found off the coast of Alaska, Canada, Russia, and Europe. And to go through the taxonomy here, and I'm gonna try to explain some of these weird looking terms, um, beluga whales are all a part of the kingdom Animalia. So that includes all animals. They are part of the phylum chordata. So that includes all animals that have a spinal cord, but believe it or not, there are some that don't. Um, they are all part of the class mammalia. So they are mammals and they are in the order cetacea and cetacea covers all of our whales. Within that order, they are actually part of a suborder called odontoceti or odontocetes. And Jenna will also be talking about this topic in a little bit. Odontocetes basically means toothed whales. So the odontocete suborder um, includes all those whales that have one or more teeth. Um, belugas are part of the family Monodontidae, which is kind of a mouthful. Um, that family includes only one other whale and that is the narwhal, which is also an Arctic whale. It's about the same size as a beluga. Um, and it is very known for its um, distinct tusk that looks kind of like a unicorn horn. Um, and that tusk actually is a tooth, believe it or not, which is kind of crazy. Um, beluga whales, all of them are also part of the genus and species Delphinapterus lucus. And after all of that, I also want to highlight the fact that um, when it comes to the Cook Inlet beluga population, they are what is known as a distinct population segment. So what this means is that they're genetically and geographically isolated from other beluga populations. And we have a map here on this slide. Um, it shows the five beluga populations that are found in and around Alaska. The Cook Inlet beluga population is basically the southernmost population. Um, they live year round in Cook Inlet. They do not migrate. And you can see that they are separated from the other four populations by this very large peninsula of land that extends to the southwest. Uh, now, just a tidbit for you guys who have been following the news and might have heard, um, there has been a beluga that's been hanging around the uh, Seattle-Tacoma area in Washington state. And we have learned this, re this week that that beluga is very likely from the Beaufort Sea population, which if you look at this map here, that's that population that is on the border of Alaska and Canada to the east. So that individual whale, for whatever reason, decided to take a, a whale of equivalent of a road trip and has gone far south um, to visit Seattle for reasons unknown. Um, also a fun fact for you all, 
is that belugas, like bats and some other select mammals, they use echolocation, which is a special kind of sound generation, to hunt. And belugas make specific sounds actually when they are catching their prey. It's called a terminal buzz. I like to think of it as kind of a joyful sound of, I've got a snack. Um, so we can tell when a beluga actually cap captured a fish by that terminal buzz sound. And that comes into play in some things I'll talk about later. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share some background on the population trend of Cook Inlet belugas. So back in the 1970s, we estimated that there were approximately about 1300 Cook Inlet belugas. And our most recent estimate for this population is that we only have 279 individuals remaining. And that's a decline of approximately 80%, which is pretty drastic for that period of time. Now, the cause for the original decrease in the population is thought to have been uh, overharvest. So this is a population of whales that are subsistence harvested by Alaska natives for um, personal use and um, they're very important culturally. And because the population was declining, those Alaska Native communities actually voluntarily um, chose to stop hunting in the late 90s and early 2000s. And there's been no hunting since then. And the hope was that as a result that the population would rebound. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, uh, the population has continued to decline. And in 2008, NOAA Fisheries decided to list the Cook Inlet Beluga whale population as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. Um, while hunting is no longer an active threat, some potential threats that could be actively preventing the population from recovering have been identified, and those include ocean noise, habitat loss, prey limitations, pollution, and climate change. So um, probably a lot of you aren't very familiar with uh, Alaska and the Alaska coastline. Cook Inlet is um, actually home to a lot of human activity. The largest city in Alaska is Anchorage and it is on the shores of Cook Inlet. The largest port in the state is also located in Anchorage. Um, we have a large international airport, so we've got aircraft flying over. We have a lot of fishing activity throughout Cook Inlet, both commercial and personal use. And we have a lot of oil and gas development. And so these whales are living in an environment where there is a lot of human activity overlapping with where they wanna be. So NOAA Fisheries and our partners are currently conducting a number of different research projects so that we can better understand which of these types of threats might be most impacting the population's ability to increase and ultimately understand why the population isn't growing and what we can do to help. Next slide, please. So I don't have time to talk in depth about all of this different research, um, but I wanted to highlight the diversity of research that we have ongoing for Cook Inlet Blugas. So we conduct surveys from um, aircraft as well as from boats, and that gives us information about um, changes in the numbers of individuals in the population. We can also learn um, estimates of uh, calf production on an annual basis, which can tell us about how many individuals are being introduced in the or added to the population annually. We also conduct photo identification, and I think Jenna's going to talk more about this um, and uh, in an easier way because her whales have more patchy coloration to them. Um, beluga whales are mostly white, but they do have distinctive marks and we can identify individual whales. And we have a long-term photo identification project um, that allows us to identify individuals and also learn more about them, um, where they occur within their habitat on a seasonal basis, as well as whether they're male or female, because you can't tell that from a whale, a beluga whale just by looking at them. But if they have a calf next to them, that's a pretty good indicator that it's a female and it's an adult and she's reproductively active. We also conduct acoustic monitoring. Um, Cook Inlet actually is a pretty murky water body. It is pretty, you can't see in these photos, but it's kind of like the consistency of hot chocolate. There's a lot of glacial silt input into the system. 
Uh, but luckily, belugas are very vocal. And so you can see in the top right photo, um, we have some researchers deploying some acoustic equipment. And so that helps us learn when and where throughout the year belugas are using different parts of their habitat, whether they are um, foraging in that area since they make sounds that are unique to hunting prey. And it also can give us information about what kind of human produced sounds are in that part of their habitat. We also conduct prey surveys. Um, we do that with nets as well as environmental DNA, which you may or may not have heard about, but it is essentially where we're able to collect water samples and extract DNA from them. Cook Inlet Belugas really love to eat salmon and um, other kinds of smelts that uh, vary in their abundance on a seasonal basis. Um, but they eat a variety of other foods. And so prey surveys allow us to understand how um, prey availability might change um, within the year and also over time. We also study stranded animals. So Cook Inlet Beluga has, or pardon me, Cook Inlet has um, some of the most extreme tides on the planet, if not the most extreme. And while the Cook Inlet Belugas are pretty well adapted to handle those situations, it is unfortunately not uncommon for Cook Inlet Belugas to strand either alive or more often we have dead carcasses wash ashore. And in those cases, we work with uh, veterinarians to collect samples um, so that we can learn more about the health of the animals and particularly what we are looking at things like contaminants and disease. We also partner with aquariums across the country that have captive belugas um, in them. So Shed Aquarium is one, Georgia Aquarium, which you see in the lower um, half of the slide here is another. These belugas um, that are in captivity are trained to help with our research and they are able to provide us with information about things, particularly uh, metabolic uh, information and caloric needs. So we can learn a lot about what the differing needs for survival of a beluga is um, and how it differs depending on whether it's a female, a male, what age it is, whether it's pregnant, whether it's nursing and all of that information. And we can then apply all of that to computer modeling efforts that are underway where we can look at the overall um, metabolic and caloric needs of the belugas, what's available in their environment and then how that might change if there's stressors such as the availability or the timing of the prey changes or whether there's climate change impacts. So we have a lot of work underway for Quick Inlet Belugas to try and help us identify what the major threats are and how we can work to recover the population. And I'm very happy to be able to share some of that with you. And now I will pass it to Jenna, unless uh, Carrie wants to take a break for Beluga questions. We do have a beluga question. Um, so what information can you gain from a, um, a stranded beluga or a dead beluga? And is it important to collect information? Yeah, so, um, you know, a, a, a dead whale is always a sad thing for a marine mammal biologist. We like to see them alive and swimming around and healthy. Um, but we can, especially with a very small population where um, we don't want researchers going out and, you know, taking samples from live individuals if they can avoid it or it, attaching tracking devices to them if they can avoid it. We can learn a lot from a dead individual. So um, we take samples depending on the condition of the carcass. Um, we take samples of all the different organs, the skin, the blubber. Um, we can learn information about anything from parasites that are present, um, viruses, bacteria, um, and uh, other diseases, as well as measure contaminant exposure. Um, and because that work has been ongoing for quite a long time, um, Though the sample size is small, you know, maybe uh, seven to 10 individuals per year, probably less um, because they come to us in different states of uh, decomposition. Um, we do get a basic understanding over time and can kind of track maybe if there are new diseases that they're being exposed to 
for whatever reason, or, or their contaminant load is increasing. So um, it's as sad as it is to have a dead whale, it is really, really valuable to increasing our knowledge of the population and its health. That's very interesting. So girls, I see a lot of questions pop up, but why don't we continue on and learn about the North Pacific right whale from Jenna, and we, we can always come back to more questions. Great, thanks, Carrie. And I see some awesome questions coming in for you, Jill, so definitely check those out. So I'm excited to introduce to you the North Pacific right whale or Eubalaena japonica. And this is another critically endangered whale species that we can find in Alaska. Now, if you take a look at the taxonomy, you're gonna see that the first few things look very similar to the cook and the beluga because these are, again, they're whales. So they are up to the order cetacea. But when we get to the suborder, we're switching from the odontocete or toothed whales like a beluga to the mysticity or baleen whales, which are right whales, humpback whales, blue whales, and many others. So right whales are in the family Belavidae, and this is all right whales plus bowhead whales, which are a species that are found up in the high Arctic. And their genus, Eubalaena, you, um, means specifically right whales. And Japonica helps us understand that it's from the North Pacific, um, where, you know, off the coast of Japan and in other areas. So, Mississippi means baleen whales, and baleen is this really cool substance, or these really this really cool feature that these whales have that's made out of keratin. So it's made out of the same stuff as your hair and your fingernails. And if we take a look at the picture on the right here of these what looks like plates with little shaggy ends, those are um, those are plates of baleen. Those are actually from a humpback whale, but it helps illustrate that there are these plates that kind of lay next to each other with this shaggy end. And the whales use this baleen like a big sieve to get their food out of the water. So if you think about when you make spaghetti and you go to dump it into the sink and you've got your sieve or your colander in there, the baleen acts like that colander and it takes, lets all the water out, but it keeps all the food inside. And so right whales can actually be pretty large. They can get to be over 50 feet long and over two, up to 200,000 pounds. And they have two to 300 plates of this baleen in their mouths and they use it to strain out microscopic prey from the water. So the copepods and the shrimp that you see on the bottom of the screen are some of their favorite food. But these humongous whales are able to sustain themselves on itty bitty food using baleen. So it's a really cool adaptation and I think baleen whales are pretty great. Next slide, please. So there are three species of, of right whales. We have our North Pacific, uh, the North Atlantic that you may have noticed on the species in the spotlight slide. And these guys are, are pretty popular on the East Coast. And then the Southern right whales, which are only found in the Southern Hemisphere. So these guys are pretty easy to distinguish from other whales in the wild, uh, as you can see some of their features here. But I really wanna focus on this picture in the middle of the whale with its snout out of the water. And it has these white bumps on it. These are called callosities, and callosities are calcified skin patches that get colonized by barnacles and whale lice and other little critters, but they are essentially like a fingerprint because the callosities on a whale are different from any other whale. So this allows scientists to be able to identify these whales if we see pictures, as Jill mentioned, with photo ID, or if we see them out in, out in the wild, we can use the callosities as an indicator to know if we've seen this whale before and where we've seen it. So this is a really cool way for us to help identify these, this particular species. Next slide, please. So North Pacific right whales are one of the most rare large whale species in the world. And we call them right whales because during commercial whaling, they were the quote unquote right whale to hunt. And this goes for all right whales around the world. And they like to swim really slowly, they swim near the surface, and if they were being hunted, if they were struck, they floated so they were easy to retrieve by the hunters. So needless to say, the right whales around the world were hunted almost to extinction. And even though commercial whaling mostly stopped in the 1930s, there was a lot of illegal whaling that took place in the North Pacific and in other areas up through the 1960s. And this really did a number on the North Pacific right whales. So we actually have two populations. There's one that lives over off the coast of Japan and Russia. 
And we don't know too much about this population and we think it could have anywhere from 200 or a couple hundred to a couple thousand individuals. And then there's the population that lives off the coast of the US and Canada. And that's the population that my office, NOAA Fisheries, is responsible for managing. And we think that there are maybe about 30 individuals in this population. So when I say they're one of the lar rarest large whales, it's because there's very, very few of them. Next slide, please. Because there's so few of them, there's a lot that we don't know. For example, we don't know where they go in the winter time. We don't know where they go to have their young. We don't know how many males versus females or adults versus juveniles. Um, there's just, there's, there's a lot of different things we have to figure out. But there are ways that we are going about trying to answer these questions. And Jill actually set me up very nicely because she talked a lot about some of these uh, research methods that we use for whales, including aerial and vessel-based surveys. Um, we can attach satellite or radio tags to whales if we find them, which allows us to follow where they go and see what they do. And um, Jill also mentioned acoustic monitoring, but honestly with right whales, one of the, the best ways that we've found to learn about the, the species is through um, use of acoustics. So if we go to the next slide, this map on the left-hand side shows the location of various types of acoustic equipment that is deployed off the coast of Alaska. And so what we can do is we get the data from this various equipment and special scientists called acousticians will analyze this data and interpret it for us so that we can know if a right whale was in the area, when it was there, and maybe what it was even doing. And a lot of this equipment can be really bulky and heavy. If you see on the right, those are cranes that are putting um, some acoustic equipment into the, out into the field in the water. But in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see two women. And these are Jessica Krantz and Dr. Katherine Burchock, who are amazing scientists who work at NOAA's Marine Mammal Lab in Seattle. And they are the ladies that are responsible for interpreting this acoustic data and helping us better understand the species. Next slide. So 2021 was a very exciting year for North Pacific right whales. And I'm hoping we can get this video to work and we can show you. But even though there's maybe 30 or less of them, what we have is that um, NOAA scientists, can we see if we can get the video to play, please? Um, ah, there we go, perfect. So NOAA scientists actually saw four North Pacific right whales this summer in August while they were on a vessel survey. And these are two of them right here. And one of these whales had been seen off the coast of Canada in July. So we know that it was traveling north from Canada up to the Gulf of Alaska. And two of the other whales had been previously seen by um, NOAA scientists in the past. And we know that one of them was last seen in 2006. So that's 15 years ago. So this is really exciting. Everybody's really jazzed up about this. And it's kind of helped uh, put North Pacific right whales back on the map and get us really excited about them. So us, uh, myself and our scientists in Seattle are really working to try to better understand the species so that we can be better managers and help with its recovery. And I think with that, we're gonna be moving back to Carrie. Hello Girl Scouts. So we are on our third step. And of course, as always, we want to advocate with art, make a creative project inspired by endangered species. The ideas are endless from an original work, artwork, public service announcements, storybooks, board games, infographs, create to inspire. So I do have something to put out there. Um, Noah, Noah's Marine Debris has a contest up until December um, 10th, and I will put the link in the, the chat, but you guys can create and inspire and enter a contest. So definitely check it out. Um, check the booklet out for more ideas or create something on your own. Um, if you wanna share, we would love to see anything in hashtag GS Saving Endangered Species. So I, the Endangered Species Pact has a meeting as every species is important as they circle around our planet. I created and designed the artwork in this patch and drew each of the illustrations to share with you and highlight the Endangered Species Act. Did you know that all the illustrations on the patch are endangered species and are listed on page five of the booklet? Let's take a look. 
We have endangered species. We have green sea turtles to salamanders to a redwood wolf, a Virginia eared bat, polar bears, Atlantic coast piping clovers, which are birds, an American chestnut, the North Atlantic right whale, to a Baltimore checkered spot butterfly, a northern white rhino, and of course, northern rockhopper penguins. Um, so definitely check out the patch. And as we move on, the idea is to have an experience. And this is why we have our NOAA guest online. So I would like to again introduce our NOAA researchers, as we've already heard from them specifically talk about the species they protect. But we are going to talk about how they um, how they came to their career and what enlightened them to do what they do. I'm going to let's see, pass it over to Jill. Thanks, Carrie. And I think this is a really important part of this presentation. This kind of information is stuff that I didn't have access to when I was in um, high school or middle school or preparing for a future in science. Um, so um, as a toddler, I'll start off by saying, I always love the beach. My first sentence actually was, let's go beach. And then as I um, went through school, elementary school, middle school, high school, um, I continued to love biology and would tell people that I wanted to be a marine mammal biologist, but I had a lot of varied interests, probably like a lot of you did. Um, and one of those was music. And I was very much encouraged to pursue that um, through school and as a professional career. And I will start off by saying the long story short is that um, despite loving music and continuing to love music, I did uh, go ahead and pursue biology. And at this point, I've been working with endangered species for 19 years now. Next slide. So this is the story of how I got there. Um, so as I was leaving high school, um, I decided to attend college and I picked Mills College in Oakland, California. It's a small liberal arts school. I picked it because I had a very strong music program um, and all the adults in my life up until that point had said, you can't make a living as a marine mammal biologist. You should go in and um, pursue music. Um, Mills did have a good but small biology program, so I went there um, with the intent of getting a major in music and a minor in biology. And probably a lot of you have also heard, but somehow in my childhood I didn't, that it is really hard to make a living as a musician. Um, but no one was saying that to me, and so it took me until, until my junior year of college to figure out that it probably wasn't any more difficult to make a living as a marine mammal biologist than it was as a musician. And so I decided to stay um, and uh, get a double major. So I switched my biology major minor to a major at Mills College. Um, and because Mills was a small college, the only wildlife professor they had on staff um, didn't have any marine mammal connections but he was very interested in uh, ground squirrels of the Mojave Desert. And so that was my wildlife um, field work opportunity that I could get through college. And it was actually a lot of fun, as you can see here, I'm having a great time. Um, so I was a seasonal field tech capturing uh, ground squirrels in the Mojave Desert for several years until I got my bachelor's degree in music and biology at Mills in 2006. Um, at that point, I knew I wanted to go on to graduate school to become a marine mammal biologist, but I didn't have any kind of connection. I didn't know anyone who worked with marine mammals, anyone who could be a mentor to me, um, any kind of path forward. I also kind of needed a job in general, um, having left college and graduated. And luckily, I was hired as a biologist for a newly formed consulting firm in San Francisco called EMPSI. Um, I didn't get to do any kind of field work with them, but I spent a lot of time learning about uh, federal policy and wildlife management and conducting environmental analyses. And I was able to supplement that actually um, by going on a volunteer vacation 
to Belize through the Oceanic Society, um, which is a nonprofit that supports um, ocean conservation and research. And I was able to go to Belize and spent a couple of weeks with researchers helping them um, research bottlenose dolphin behavior. And between all of the uh, experiences that I had um, and my degree, I applied to the University of Alaska Fairbanks and I was accepted as a graduate student to their marine biology graduate program in 2008. And um, while I started as a master's student, my project actually grew exponentially and I ended up um, transitioning into a doctorate student or a PhD student. And my work focused around um, Pacific walruses feeding ecology, zoonotic disease, and climate change. And for those of you who might not be familiar with it, zoonotic disease is a disease or diseases that are uh, transmittable from animals to humans. So I spent a lot of time in the field in Alaska, um, up on the North Coast in the northernmost incorporated city in the country, which used to be called Barrow and is now called Utkiavik, working with subsistence hunters whose culture and traditions rely upon harvesting uh, marine mammals for food and for cultural and historic purposes. It's an amazing area and I learned a ton. And as you can see from some of the photos, um, there's a lot of wildlife there, including polar bears. Um, in the latter half of my time as a graduate student, I was also hired as a senior scientist with a consulting firm called ABR, which was local to Fairbanks, Alaska. And that gave me the opportunity to spend quite a lot of time in boats, helicopters, and aircraft. Um, surveying for marine mammals as well as breeding seabirds. And when I graduated with my PhD in 2014, I applied for and was offered a position at the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, also called BOEM, um, in Anchorage, Alaska. And BOEM is the federal agency that oversees offshore energy development. And basically what I was doing there was very similar to what I had been doing at the consulting firm in San Francisco. A lot of desk work, a lot of environmental analysis. And it was um, very interesting. I was very focused on Arctic species. Um, however, I really missed getting the opportunity to do field work. And so in 2016, I left that position and took a break from the cold of Alaska to go back to California where I was a senior scientist with US Fish and Wildlife. Um, this was a pretty drastic change for me, a lot more field work, it was great. Um, no marine mammals at all, as you can probably tell from the photos. Um, so I was the senior scientist in charge of conserving endangered species in the Sierra Nevadas, um, which are mostly frogs, toads, and um, turtles. I got to work in Yosemite, I got to work in Sequoia Kings Canyon, I got to work in Lake Tahoe, and I learned a lot. Um, but I very much missed working with marine mammals and I very much lived, missed living in Alaska. So um, in 2021, at the very beginning of this year, I applied for and accepted a position with NOAA Fisheries in Anchorage. And that's the position that I have today, um, coordinating recovery for Cook Inlet Belugas. And so that is the long story of how I went from being a musician almost to being a marine mammal specialist. That is awesome, Jill. Thank you for sharing your career story. And I'm gonna pass it right over to Gemma as I forward the screen. Great, thanks, Carrie. And um, thank you, Jill, for, for that great explanation of, of your career thus far. And um, I have to say, I, I also was a big fan of the ocean when I was a, when I was a kid. Um, in fact, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see me scooting around the intertidal uh, in Massachusetts, and that's a dead lobster that I have, which I found it that way. I did not make it that way. Um, but as a kid growing up in Connecticut, I spent my summers uh, on the coast of Massachusetts and Maine, and I really just fell in love with the ocean and knew that it's what I wanted to study when I got older. So that's why I decided to go to the University of Maine to pursue a bachelor's of science. 
And actually during my last semester, my last summer between uh, my years as an undergrad, I had an internship as a research intern on whale watching boats in Gloucester, Massachusetts, where I got to see humpback whales and fin whales and all sorts of really amazing things. And that kind of made me want to go into marine science, but similar to what Jill shared with you, it's not an easy field to break into. And um, I was kind of told marine mammals are a very closed, closed uh, community. And so I figured, all right, well, what else can I do to stay involved in science? And I started applying for graduate school and I ended up at the University of Maryland studying oysters and oyster parasites. I knew absolutely nothing about oysters and oyster parasites. Um, however, I learned very quickly. And uh, this is a photo of myself and one of our, our lab technicians doing surveys of oyster reefs in Maryland. And during this experience, I realized, well, I really love doing research. I really like that, um, you know, my advisor helps me out a lot. I, I would like to have her job someday of being a research professor at a university and working with graduate students. And, um, you know, and I realized that that required getting a PhD. So I was like, well, this is great. Let's continue and maybe I'll do something a little bit different because oysters are they're not the most exciting thing in the world. They're interesting, but not that exciting. Well, lo and behold, I end up getting into the University of Georgia in 2011, and I end up studying oysters. <laughs> um, however, I was able to uh, answer or ask some really interesting questions, and I did some experiments with sharks and crabs and different types of fish, and I got to learn all sorts of really cool techniques for uh, looking for parasites and determining how many parasites an oyster had. So that was, it was a really great experience. Um, I, as you can see, I was out on boats a lot. I played in the mud a whole heck of a lot in the salt marshes uh, in Savannah. If any of you have heard of Savannah, Georgia, that's where I did. Um, <laughs> I see that someone's uh, in Georgia, very cool. I think Abby. Um, yeah, so I, I did all my experiments in Savannah and uh, about halfway through my PhD, I realized that uh, being a university professor and uh, having that type of lifestyle wasn't necessarily what I wanted. And uh, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do, but my advisor actually suggested that I apply for a marine policy fellowship. Well, similar to when I went to grad school in the first place and knew nothing about oysters, I knew even less about marine policy. But I applied for this, this, poli this policy internship that's actually hosted through NOAA's Sea Grant program, and I got awarded the fellowship. So after I graduated with my PhD, I moved up to Maryland again. And uh, I had a position with the United States Marine Mammal Commission. And this is a small agency that was actually created by the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So if you were to look at the act, there's actually a section that says there will be a Marine Mammal Commission that provides oversight, yada, yada. Well, this agency was a great place to be for this fellowship because I got to do so many different things. I got to go to Capitol Hill and meet members of Congress. I hosted a briefing on Capitol Hill about marine mammal bycatch. I also was part of their Arctic communications team. And that meant that I got to go to Alaska for the very first time in my life, which was great because this has always been a bucket list place for me to, to visit. And in the lower left-hand corner, you can see me next to a plane. Well, I got to go to Nome, Alaska, which is on the Seward Peninsula. And then I got to fly in this tiny little plane over to St. Lawrence Island and meet with a lot of Alaska Native hunters and talk to them about their hunting experiences and the changes they were seeing with marine mammals as the climate was changing. And I just really fell in love with it. So during my fellowship, I wrote a grant proposal asking for money from an organization so that I could go back to Alaska and have more conversations about, with hunters about how they interacted with the government, specifically with uh, NOAA and with the Fish and Wildlife Service, to cooperatively manage the different species they use for subsistence, so the, the species that they use for food. And interestingly enough, and luckily for me, uh, that grant actually got funded. So after spending a year with NOAA's Marine Debris Program, which Carrie actually just mentioned has their art contest, which is fantastic, and I strongly encourage you all to uh, put in some drawings for consideration. After working with the Marine Debris Program, I packed up my dog and a couple of suitcases and moved to Alaska. And in 2018, I traveled all over the place and I got to see polar bears in Utiavik. I got to stick my hand in the Beaufort Sea up in um, Point Barrow, which is the most northern point of land in the United States. 
I traveled to Dutch Harbor, uh, which is, if any of you have ever heard of Deadliest Catch or know anything about King Crab, this is one of the biggest ports for King Crab uh, in the world. And I got to fly on little planes and go on helicopters. And I got to learn a lot from so many absolutely fantastic people. I had evolved from being, a so, uh, being a, an ecologist playing in the mud to being a social scientist studying people and people's relationships. And this set me up really fantastically for the job I have now as a marine mammal specialist, because I still get to work on this relationship between the government and Alaska Native hunters. And that's one of my favorite parts of my job. But as you can see in the bottom right corner, um, I get to do really cool things like go on Cook and Lit Beluga aerial surveys, which I did in the spring. And with any luck, if the weather cooperates next week, I will be out in the plane again. Um, so this position has been great for me. I've been here for two and a half years, but I, I have to say that as someone who's transitioned a lot from, you know, not knowing what they wanted to do to studying oysters, to then do going into policy and working on marine mammals, um, I think the best thing that anybody can do for themselves is to, to build your professional toolbox and to, to make, take experiences where you can get the skills that you need to take on any problem that you want. So just because you study oysters for your graduate work does not need, mean that you are an oyster ecologist for the rest of your life. I study marine mammals now and I work on marine mammal conservation. I never would have known that five years ago when I graduated with my PhD. So pretty much anything is possible if you give yourself the right skills to get where you want to go. So I have to say to all of you brilliant young ladies out there, think about what you want, what questions you want to answer, and get yourself the, the tools that you need to answer those questions, and you're going to do absolutely awesome. Jill and right. Jenna, you've both been so inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing. So we are going to quickly go through a couple things. Um, girls, step five, of course, is present. This step is truly up to you. Check out the booklet for some great ideas. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, you got to listen to us being passionate about endangered species and our environment. It is up to you. Here's your opportunity to take everything that you've learned and enjoyed and put it into action. So don't forget to complete the rest of the patch. Um, you could celebrate the Endangered Species Act with Younger Girl Scouts, reaching out to your service unit manager and getting involved with a younger troop. You could even consider putting together some virtual resources for younger girls to learn about endangered species. Let's see, the Endangered Species Act provides common sense balanced solution for government agencies, landowners, and concerned citizens to conserve endangered wildlife and their habitats. So make sure your information that you're presenting reflects your standards of quality, balance, and fairness. So definitely live by the Girl Scout law. So search the Endangered Species Act. What information is new in the news? Are the articles all the same or subjected to a specific point of view? Facts are very important to so develop your own set of criteria for evaluating the quality, balance, and fairness of the information that you present. Develop your own set of standards. So our Jill and Jenna can enlighten us on how we can protect and care about these species, even though we are on the other side of the country. Sure, I'm gonna run through this real quick because I know we're over time. And first off, I wanna say to everybody, Abalone are really cool. If you don't know what they are, they're like the world's most awesome snail. Um, their shells are really shiny and you should check them out. Um, so anyways, back to marine mammals. Um, a couple of things you can do is just make sure you maintain distance when you see marine mammals. Don't get too close. You don't want to disturb them. Um, if you see a dead or injured marine mammal um, when you're visiting the coast or if you live near there, NOAA has a stranding network a hotline that you can call. Um, we have people on call 24 hours a day to respond to your calls if you see an injured um, or dead marine mammal or turtle in distress. Um, and we will deploy researchers and veterinarians to respond to that. 
Um, also, obviously, cleaning up beaches is very important. Even if you don't live near a beach, cleaning up parks or just your roadways near your neighborhood. Um, when the rain comes, all of that trash gets washed towards the ocean and it's no good for animals that live there. Um, choosing sustainable seafood so that you make sure that um, you're not depleting prey resources for the marine mammals that everybody loves. And also a lot of times um, there are opportunities to become involved as a volunteer for um, different kinds of imperiled species in your neighborhood, whether they're endangered species, whether they're marine mammals, it could be birds, it could be anything else. Um, it's federal agencies, state agencies, local nonprofits, Audubon, um, they all need your help to let them know when you when and where you see different kinds of animals. Um, and that helps them better manage uh, and conserve those populations. So do some investigating and find out what's available in your area. And I'm going to pass it to Jenna because she's got some additional thoughts on what you can do if you're hanging out around larger whales. Great. Thanks, Jill. So um, Jill is lucky that her species lives in a place where people can easily see it. But North Pacific right whales tend to be found out in the Bering Sea and in the Gulf of Alaska. However, um, this is the advice here is also applicable if you happen to be out on a boat and you see a North Atlantic right whale or if you get to get out on the sea here in Alaska, that's so fantastic. Um, I'd be very, very jealous. But um, a few things you can do for whales in general is you wanna slow down if you happen to be out on the water and see a whale. Um, some of these whales move really slowly, they don't react very quickly. So you certainly don't wanna startle it or cause it to swim towards your boat. Um, but another great thing you can do is take photographs. And uh, if you remember, we talked about those callosities on right whales. If you happen to get a picture of a head or if, um, for other species, if you see their tail fluke, like the, the middle picture of the fluke up in the air, if you can get a photo of that, um, these types of pictures are really helpful for scientists for any species of whale. And another thing you can do is report it. So if you happen to see a live whale somewhere um, and if you're you know, have the ability to say, hey, you know, report the whale to NOAA and say, we saw such and such whale at this place at this time, so that we're aware of where these whales are and we can kind of keep track of them. But anything you can do to help with whales, uh, like Jill said, you know, cleaning up beaches, not having debris, because even out in the middle of the ocean, uh, North Pacific right whales can be affected by marine debris. So there's small things that we can all do to help uh, conserve these species. Ladies, those are all great tips. Thank you very much. Um, we are gonna keep going. So girls, Girl Scouts always take action. There are a handful of things you can do. You can share an issue that matters to your community. I would suggest calling or writing your state, federal senators or representatives or your Congress office and explain why you care about this important topic. The why is the most important. So Girl Scouts, I encourage you to write letters to also local businesses to encourage them how to implement environment-friendly policies, not giving out plastic straws or utensils, maybe not using styrofoam takeout containers, not using plastic bags, state regulators are also important. Girls, you can write to your town council or state legislators to encourage them to ban plastic bags or um, straws. It, Let's see, oops, um, let's see. Think globally and act locally. We ask ourselves, what does that really mean? I wanna give you a big example. So boycotting balloon releases. People release them locally, but they are, are, they are a global problem. Where do they end up? Um, everywhere, anywhere. So did you know that Maryland passed legislation, um, SB 716, slash HB 39 to ban state side balloon releases a few days before Earth Day 2021. Virginia has also passed very similar legislation too. So they acted locally and now it is a statewide ban. So just to give you an idea, so a local effort called Bloom's Balloon Roundup started in 2018 with two Ocean City siblings, only 10 and 12 years old, encourage builders to pull balloons from the water. As of spring, they had tallied over 3,500 balloon cleanups from waterfronts from New Jersey to Florida. That is amazing. 
So we are the solution. Girl Scouts, you can make it happen. Um, let's see. Make your own pledge. Start locally with you. So I'll share my quick pledge with you. I've been dedicated to the five R's. So refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and recover because we are the solution. And I know that I can make a difference. So I've been composting at our public works for almost three years. Um, let's see, I hope you've enjoyed our partnership with NOAA and this great virtual webinar while enlightening you to complete this endangered species patch program. I want to thank our amazing NOAA researchers, Jill and Jenna from Alaska, from Alaska for sharing their careers, enlightening us on the Cook Inlet beluga whales and the North Pacific right whales. So maybe becoming a research scientist is in your future and protecting our environment and endangered species. Make every day an endangered species day. There are so many individual actions that you can take. Everyone can play a part in saving these species and protecting our environment. So let's really quickly um, recap what we have done on our webinar. So we have done pretty much step two, investigate, and we've done step four, an experience. So girls, you still need to explore the rest of the Endangered Species Act. You need to create something amazing and share it. And of course, step five, it is take action. Um, so I have, let's see, oops. Um, I have a survey for you guys to complete. We'll drop it in the chat but it's important for you guys to share your opinions with us. So please let us know how we're doing. Let's inspire all Girl Scouts. Um, we do have some time for some questions. I saw some quick questions um, just to let you guys know. Let's, let me make sure. Um, let's see, the white abalone is endangered and it is, a, it is one of the species in the spotlights, one of the nine species. Um, I also have a handout for you guys. So I will go ahead and put that in the chat too. Um, let's see. Um, Jill or Jenna, as you were going through, did you see any of the questions in the chat that you wanted to answer while I'm dropping these in the chat? Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Okay. Um, I have answered a few of them. Uh, I've typed up some answers uh, to folks, um, but I'm I'm seeing some actually really great questions. You ladies are are on the ball here with your knowledge of whales and different species. Um, for the the question I'm seeing about Noah helping protect the longfin pilot whales that are hunted in the Faroe Islands um, and if they're endangered. That's a great question, and Jill, please step in if you have more information. But um, because they, that's an international species, we can really only work with the species that are um, within the jurisdiction of the United States. Uh, we can help with species that are international, but in terms of any types of regulations or whatnot that go into place, there's it's not really something, at least not in our office, that we do. Um, and I, I'll have to double check if it's endangered or not. But um, that's a really great question. Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent answer. And I think that's applicable to a lot of the species, you know, marine mammals don't pay any attention to the um, delineations that we put in terms of boundaries for national or international waters. So when it comes to conservation, um, I know NOAA Fisheries collaborates as much as possible with our international partners. Um, but, you know, we also need to be respectful and not overstep our boundaries and just stomp in telling other people what to do. Um, so it's a collaborative effort and um, certainly often a learning situation. So I think you described it really well, Jenna. So I guess one question would be how many, let's see, how many species of whales inhabit our ocean, our planet? That is a fantastic question. And Jill, I don't know. I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I'm not sure if you do. You know, I, um, I regret I don't have it memorized, but I will say, um, you know, as a biologist, and this isn't unique to whales, um, 
we are constantly learning new things about our planet and the species that inhabit it. And sometimes we learn that um, what we thought was one species is more than one. Um, and that's probably part of the reason why biologists don't try to memorize an absolute number um, because things are constantly changing. So um, I could probably Google and look it up for you, but chances are in a couple of years that could be different um, because we're constantly learning more about the species around us and using tools like genetics to understand situations where two individuals might look almost exactly the same to the you know regular eye, but when you look at their genetic code, maybe they are actually very different. So there's a lot, a lot of ways to categorize species and it's ever evolving and we are constantly learning, so. Well, I just saw in the news that the Gulf of Mexico, they are usually Brutus whales and they yep. just ID'd, I think it's a rice whale. So very interesting. Yeah, I was gonna bring that example up, Carrie. That's that's really great. Um, so just very quickly, I'm on the NOAA Fisheries website and we're popping up at 32 species of whales. That's just whales, that's not including dolphins and porpoises. But I'm not sure if this is a restricted list for uh, um, marine mammals that are under the US jurisdiction. I think there are actually quite a few other cetacean species that are not showing up here, but um, oh no, narwhals are on here, so maybe. Um, but yeah, there's, there's quite a few, uh, quite a few marine mammals in general, not just whales, but also um, seals and sea lions. Something light would be, do you guys have a favorite marine mammal or is that the marine mammal that you're researching right now? That is, I don't know about you, Jenna, that's very hard for me to choose. Um, I will say when I started graduate school, I had a least favorite marine mammal and that was walrus. And um, of course that was what I got asked to go study. Um, so now there are no longer, I don't think I have a least favorite anymore. Um, picking a favorite is hard. I think oftentimes it's ones that I work with closely or it's also ones that I don't have the opportunity to learn a lot about and would like to know more. Like I'd love to learn more about narwhals. Who wouldn't? They're pretty awesome. Yes. And also vaquitas. I think vaquitas are awesome as well. And I would love to work with them. Well, unlike Jill, I actually, uh, walrus might be my favorite uh, marine mammal in general. Sorry, Jill, I love them. It is my dream to see one in the wild one day. Um, my favorite whale growing up was a humpback whale, but I will say North Pacific right whales are so awesome. And uh, I'm very excited to be able to work with them. And I just saw the question, uh, what about vaquitas? And this is another really kind of sad story about an endangered species. And there are possibly fewer than 10 individuals uh, left of the vaquita. So they're in worse shape than the North Pacific right whale is, unfortunately. Um, I know that it's, it's very challenging uh, because they're in international waters and they're um, technically governed by Mexico. And even though the United States has done a lot of research, it's been kind of challenging to work internationally. Um, so unfortunately, vaquitas, I, I, I wish I had better news for you, but um, right now it's not looking very good. Yes, yeah, so let's do one more question. I saw that, do you guys recommend any colleges for marine biology or you guys should just be doing your research? I'll jump in here and I will say, uh, so I attended the University of Maine for undergraduate in their marine science program and I absolutely loved it. And that's really what kickstarted my entire career. The people that I met, my professors that I had, who wrote me letters of recommendation all the way up through my PhD and into first jobs. Um, so I highly recommend the University of Maine, um, but there are so many really good universities. I know in California, there's a lot, and I'm sure Jill probably has, a, has some good suggestions as well. Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that, probably more than there's time for, um, but as someone who didn't originally go to school to go go to college to study marine biology and then switched into that route. Um, I think the most important thing, whether you're looking for undergraduate institution or a graduate institution, is um, to look for researchers 
and professors who are doing research that interests you. So it takes a little bit more digging, um, but it's important because um, then you can make those connections with those researchers and get started down the path of studying the species or the type of information, whether it's like acoustic disturbance or um, you know, contaminant effects or disease or public policy, any number of things. Um, but if you get connected with somebody who studies that with more marine mammals, regardless of where they're teaching, that's going to really help you out in the path that you want to pursue. And if you don't know what path you want to pursue, but you like marine mammals, then maybe just look for an institution that has a number of researchers that study various things about marine mammals and go from there. Um, one of the important things to learn is the kind of stuff you don't want to learn about or become an expert in. And that's equally important to understanding what you do want to do. Um, maybe you don't want to sit for 12 hours a day timing harbor seal dive time periods. Some people are really into that. Some people are not. It's important information, but it's not for everybody. So figure out what you like and you don't like and go from there. Ladies, that is such great advice. Um, I think we're coming to an end. So eco advocates, I can't assure you enough to fill out our survey. It gives us an idea of whether we're on the right track, if you're enjoying our webinars. And I can't thank everyone enough for joining us tonight. Um, thank you very much. And you guys have a nice evening. A warm thank you to both Jenna and Jill for taking the time and spending it with us. Thank you very much, ladies. Sorry, Oops. I missed that. Siri wants to chime in too. All right. Thank you, everyone. Don't forget to stop recording. <laughs>